Hello everyone! Welcome to St. Paul's and hello to the people on our live stream. We're going to get started with some music this morning, uh, so if you guys would join us, you may stand, you may sit, you may kneel, whatever you want to do. Be seated. Hello, Keith. <laughs> well, welcome to St. Paul's, everyone. Thank you uh, so much for joining us this morning. We are so thankful to be here worshiping with you today, and we have a lot going on here this morning, so I'm going to try and be a little bit quicker with the announcements than I usually am. We'll, we'll see. But um, first of all, though, I do want to say Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there today. Um, especially uh, to my mom. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I know you're watching from uh, Ocean City, and uh, thank you for being my mom, and thank you all for uh, being here this morning, and, and for, um, just a really special blessing to all the moms out there today. Thank you uh, for all that you do. Um, this morning, we are joined by Kyler Barr from Walnut Hill Church. We are so thankful to have him here. Pastor Ryan's going to be telling us a little bit more about him in the upcoming moments, um, but he is going to be preaching a message called, Yes, I Will Rejoice, from the book of Habakkuk. There are Bibles in the back. If you need a Bible, please feel free to help yourself um, and grab one at any point. Well, uh, we had some printer issues this morning, so we don't have message notes and announcements. But uh, if you want to just pay attention, that'd be great. The, uh, the and we have it, a couple of them are updates. The first update is that uh, this past week, we were able to hand out the study bags that we made in service last week. We actually had 180 study bags. We have a couple pictures. We had a little, little extra helper this week, which was uh, great. 
The students absolutely loved getting them. So, some of them were so surprised just to be getting one, but they were all really grateful. So I just wanted to extend that message to you. Thank you again for uh, helping to fill them. And now that they're done finals week, they could take a breath. And as you could see, that a lot of them are missing this morning. So we just uh, continue to pray for them this summer, that they have a great transition at home with their families and wherever they may be. Uh, the second update we have is from uh, Angelina and Misha. Uh, many of you know we, we collected uh, funds for Ukraine a couple weeks ago, maybe last month. Um, we raised a very significant amount here for a small community, and we are still so thankful for that. Uh, full, full disclosure, I just got the update this morning, so I know that I won't be pronouncing some of these things correctly, but I still wanted to give it right away because we, we did receive it. So I'm um, going to go through real quick. The first one is from Pastor Sergi. Lysak, and he is from Kiev, and he, uh, the first thing is they delivered 122 bottles of sunflower oil to families in Hostomol, a suburb of Kiev, on April 28th, and that's the uh, photo you see there. They've continued to deliver food packages to Bucha, Irpin, and Hostomol. They bought and brought building materials to build a new house for a family in the village of, of Ozera near Buka. Russian uh, troops had destroyed this family's home. So uh, that's the, some of the pictures you see here. Um, and this is our, our money going to use, which is kind of cool, um, right in Ukraine. Uh, we rebuilt a house, they rebuilt a house for a lady near Irpin to make it livable. Her only son was killed and her house was burned and she had no one to help her. The Lord put her on their hearts. So that's uh, another uh, photo that's attached. There's the house there. Lots of people have asked them to help restore their homes. And then from another pastor, uh, Valentina Melnuk, and he's from Restoration Church, which I believe uh, uh, Misha had attended. Um, it's in Kelmansteki. Again, I'm, I apologize for the pronouncement. They've been built housing and feeding many displaced families from regions around Kiev, as well as some uh, Mariupol and Lysychenk. They have been also sharing funds from St. Paul's and the Chopin Society with these families directly so they can purchase groceries. A new family just arrived from Leitchitzink of Pastor Natalia, whose mother needed emergency surgery. Funds were distributed to this family on May 6th, which was just this past week. So um, they are very thankful and grateful for our money and for the, the generosity that our church gave. And uh, we, again, we might be doing some more of this in the upcoming months. But um, again, thank you. And uh, thank you to Misha and Angelina for all the hard work they're doing behind the scenes to, to make sure all this happens. So um, thank you. Uh, the final announcement this morning is if, uh, if you're interested in baptism, whether it's just learning more about it or possibly being baptized, we are looking to have a class uh, in the upcoming future, but uh, Pastor Ryan wants to make sure the schedules are aligned and everything like that, so his email is behind me, ryan at stpaulswire.org. Feel free to email him if this is something that you'd like to learn more about or possibly be baptized in the future. Uh, he'd be happy to, 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 to have you in the class. Uh, well, we do have connection cards. If you don't mind pulling them out at this time, that'd be great. We ask everyone every week to fill out one of those cards. Just a great way to let us know you are here worshiping with us. On the back is a part, a section for your praises and, pray, and uh, prayer requests. We have a prayer team who prays over these cards each and every week. We'd love to be praying for you. Later in service, you'll have an opportunity to put them in our offering basket underneath the communion table. There's also one in the back of the room as you're on your way out. And then if you have any questions about St. Paul's or anything you would like to add, uh, we can connect with you that way as well. Would you please rise for today's uh, invocation prayer and then remain standing for, for worship? This morning's prayer comes from Martin Luther. Behold, Lord an empty vessel that needs to be filled. My Lord, fill it. I am weak in the faith. Strengthen me. I am cold in love. Warm me and make me fervent that my love may go out to my neighbor. I do not have a strong and firm faith. At times I doubt and am unable to trust you altogether. O oh Lord, help me. Strengthen my faith and trust in you. And Father, that is our prayer for this morning, Lord. Strengthen each one of our faiths. Strengthen us as a community and strengthen us strengthen us as individuals. Father, we give you thanks again for the mo moms in this room this morning and for um, the ones in our lives. Lord, help each one of us um, this morning to hear clearly from you. We love you and we give you so much thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are I worship you, you are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you.
Good morning, everybody. So uh, before we get into the message today, we have uh, something important to do, uh, a little bit of an announcement. Uh, so I'd like to invite uh, both Steve and Leah to stand right here. <laughs> so most of you are probably aware that here at St. Paul's, uh, about six years ago, we created a worship director position. Um, and it's an official staff position here at St. Paul's. Uh, because the role of worship director is actually a really big job. Uh, you, you show up here early, you go to that closet back there, and you unlock it and you pull out a ton of stuff, and you set it all up, and hopefully, well before then, you have coordinated with the pastor, who is sometimes indecisive and a procrastinator, on what passage is going to be spoke, spoken on, and what the focus of that passage is going to be, and then you try to coordinate a set list, picking songs that align with that, and then you try to order them in a way that flows, and you try to make sure that all the music is printed out for everyone who's playing, and figure out who's playing, and make sure it's all in the right key, and all of that. You get here early, you practice, you play, then you put it all back in there. This is a big job. Right? And if somebody is going to do it every week, it's a big commitment. So we have an official uh, staff position for that. And six years ago, we had what's called a installation ceremony for Steve Bell, who took on that role. And he has served very faithfully for six years, and he has done an awesome job. And... Uh, Yes. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, and Steve doesn't want to stop doing this job, but he would, like <laughs> he would like to share the load. And if you guys haven't noticed, there's somebody here who's very capable of doing that and also happy to do it as well. So we have decided to split the worship director position into in half, and Leah is going to lead half the weeks here, and Steve will do the other half. And so uh, we think that this is going to work out really well for everybody, and um, so, yes, yeah. <laughs> so, 
So forgive me if this seems a little formal, but I think it's good to have some formality around this sort of thing. Um, so I'm going to do the same thing that I did with Steve six years ago, and I'm going to read a couple of, of questions, and then Leah can hopefully will say I will. So we'll see. Okay. <laughs> Leah, will you do your best to use music to help our church worship God in spirit and in truth? If so, answer, with God's help, I will. I will. Leah, will you do your best to shepherd our volunteer musicians and look for opportunities to involve new musicians who share a passion for worship and the skill to lead others in worship? If so, answer, with God's help, I will. I will. Leah, will you do your best to lead our congregation and the other musicians by demonstrating an attitude of genuine worship, one of humility and reverence, an attitude that seeks the glory of God rather than the glory of self? If so, answer, with God's help, I will. I will. And if we could put up the slide there, Caleb. <laughs> Not that one, but... Yep. And then this one is for you guys. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I imagine so. Anyway, I'll just... St. Paul's Church, will you recognize Leah as our director of worship, allowing her to lead in this area of our church and encouraging her as she does so? If so, answer, we will. We will. All right. I think that sounded enthusiastic enough. So, <laughs> Leah, I pronounce you officially on staff as co-worship director at St. Paul's Church. And I'd like to invite our other co-worship director, Steve Bell, to say a prayer for Leah. Uh, would you join me in prayer? Gracious God and Heavenly Father, uh, you have placed within each of us the desire to worship something that is greater than we are. And uh, we recognize you as the object of our worship. And we run up against the limits of language and we run up against the limits of creativity as we seek to express that adoration and that devotion. But we trust you in all things and we trust the Holy Spirit to pick up where we fall short. And so Lord, we, we pray for Leah as she uh, leads. We pray for Leah and Alex as a couple. We pray for enthusiasm. We pray for energy. We pray for creativity. We pray for great patience as she deals with other musicians. We thank you for uh, what a blessing she's been to the team even in these days. And we look forward to all good things as we seek as a community to praise you and to worship you to the best of our ability. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. So as Keith said earlier, we are blessed this morning to be joined by a guest speaker. Uh, we are going to be starting a new sermon series in the book of Ephesians. Uh, not next week, but the week after that. So if you want to start reviewing that book, I encourage you to do that. Um, but this week we have Kyler Barr, who uh, is an old friend of Sarah's, actually. Um, he's from Walnut Hill Community Church in Bethel, Connecticut. He was the um, pastor of youth and young adult ministries there for six years. And uh, he is now a ministry coach, and he does uh, regional New England ministry uh, for, for youth, uh, helping to equip leaders and many other things. He actually wears quite a few hats, but let's welcome him up. All right. There we go. I, I was like, that's, that's not the starting point. And then it was magically. That's... 
this magic happens with these tech with tech teams all the time. Look at that. You didn't even see Ryan come up and grab that. That's good. So <laughs> Well, hello everyone, it's good to see you. It's good to be here. I've been in this building a couple years ago uh, when it was empty just to tour and see things. It's, it's a lot better with all of your faces here. Uh, it was fine then, but it's a lot better with all of your faces here. And so it's good to see you. Uh, as Ryan said, I'm Kyler Barr, uh, and I am want to say before any of the rest of this to you, happy Mother's Day. It's good to see you. It's good to celebrate mothers together on a day like today. I, my wife is with our four boys now. Hopefully they're celebrating her as instructed, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, we've got four boys, uh, 16, 14, 12, and 9. Uh, and we live down in Newtown, so not too far from here. And it's just good to get to ride up here and be with you all together today. Uh, and I want to just spend a, a little bit of time uh, talking to you. We're going to talk about actually a worship leader in a little while. We're going to talk about Asaph, who was the worship leader of Israel. We'll mention him in a bit. We'll be in this book of Habakkuk together, and we'll be spending a little bit of time there. Uh, but I want to start in Psalm 100. Uh, Psalm 100 is... Um, as I've been stepping into this role doing some regional ministry, Psalm 100 is something that just kept coming up. As I'm driving around, talking to people, talking about ministry, as I'm, whether I'm in the mountains or, or in the, on a beach or wherever I am, God would bring Psalm 100 to mind. And so it's become kind of a, a part of, that kind of focuses uh, some of what we're doing as we talk about what God's doing in youth and young adults and in churches across the region. Uh, and so I want to read it together with you all. Uh, it's just this great declaration of what it means to praise and follow God together. It's this great moment where we can say, okay, God, this is what we want to be about. Um, and I think often we use it as a call to worship for in a church service like this. Or we'll use it as, as this kind of remind reminder that there will be a day that we enter God's presence in, in heaven and we can enter his presence then in rejoicing. But I, I want us to broaden this and recognize that all of the earth is the Lord's. I want us to broaden this and recognize that we're in a spot where, uh, where God is at work in the towns and in the, and in the valleys and in the beaches and in the mountains of this region. Uh, and as we go into our towns and cities, just to remember that that we are entering God's presence, his, that we are entering the place that is his. And so let's read Psalm 100 together. Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever, and his faithfulness continues to each generation. Now look, this is, this is the type of thing that I want to declare, that I want to be about, that I, that I want to do as I go about life, as I look at ministry in New England, as I look at... at ministry within my own family and my own neighborhood, and yet it's really easy to not feel that way, right? It's really easy to get overwhelmed and discouraged and be in a spot where, where it's just too much. And I would guess that each of you have been in a spot where, where it's just too much, and you're overwhelmed, and you're not sure that the entering God's presence with thanksgiving is is what you're going to do in that moment, right? Uh, in fact, even when it's not about being completely overwhelmed and in a way that we're despairing, sometimes we just have so many things going on in life and different things that we want to be a part of or different distractions that we let become a part of our life and we forget that we're entering God's presence, right? That we're entering his, his sanctuary, that we're going into the place where he is. And that we should do so with joy and thanksgiving and remembering that he is God and remembering his faithfulness to us. Um, as I was thinking about this on Mother's Day this morning, I was recognizing that everyone in this room is the reason that your mother felt this way sometimes. 
Sometimes your mother felt overwhelmed and unable to really kind of walk through all that was going on in life because of you. Just think about that a moment and maybe call your mother later, okay? Uh, because there are times when, when we have these moments where everything is going on. Right? It seems like we're, we're trying to do the right things, and we're trying to walk through life the way that we should. We're trying to remember like, what this is all about, and yet everything's going wrong. We feel like we've taken the right steps, and, and things aren't adding up. I, I remember a time when this was true for me not too long ago. Uh, there have been many since too, but as I think about it, a couple years ago, I was walking through some relational difficulty with just some people in ministry, uh, and it was a couple of families that um, just were having a, a difficult time with each other. And as I walked through this, this relational challenge, we, we walked through all these different steps, and I'm not saying that, that I did it perfectly, uh, of course not. But we had a group of people that were trying to help these families, and they, uh, we, we were coming to places where we thought resolution was happening, and then we'd walk out of the room and everything would go wrong again. And it just felt like, felt like things weren't quite going the way that they were supposed to. <laughs> I'll, I'll admit, in those days, um, I found out that I loved Hallmark movies. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I get it. Maybe I should say Hallmark movie. There's only one of them. They just keep redoing it, right? Uh, but that's part of what I loved about them in those moments. I could go home from, from unpredictable moments relationally where things weren't going the way that they were supposed to go, and I could sit on the couch and I could watch something predictable. I could watch something where, hey, by the end, there's going to be a conflict, but then there will be a reminder of what it's all about, and they'll be fine, and then it'll be over. Right? And I won't have to deal with the fact that it doesn't stay fine all the time. And, and I think we, we often want to live li lives in these places where it's predictable and we know what's going to happen and, and it just went well. And yet that's not what my life looks like. And I know it's not what your lives look like. And so today as we start to look at Habakkuk, uh, we're looking at this uh, this time in Israel's history where not everything was going right. There, it was a little before the fall of the southern kingdom. As you're looking at Habakkuk, it's toward the end of the Old Testament. It's right between Nahum and Zephaniah, and it's, it's one of the, the minor prophets. Uh, minor because there's less written, not because he was less important. Uh, but as we, as we walk through this, we see someone who's in a spot where there's some, some real mess around him. And we get to see a little bit of his response here. We're going to start toward the end to see kind of the, the type of person that, that I want to be in some of those moments. And I, so as we go to three, Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19, uh, I just want to, want to look through this and, and kind of see if you've identified with where Habakkuk is a little bit. In verse 17 it says, Even though the fig trees have no blossoms... And there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails, and the fields are empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty. All right, hold on, pause. I said I wanted you to see if you relate. Maybe some of you have fig trees and vines and cattle, and I don't, right? Uh, but these are the things that he was relying on. These are the things that the people of Israel would rely on. This is, this is central to their, their kind of continued prosperity. And I've been in some spots where the things that I rely on for my prosperity don't seem to be going well. And so even as all these things are going wrong, here's what it says in verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. I love that, that piece there, verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I don't know about you, but I want to be a person who says, yet I will rejoice. In whatever circumstance I come to, in whatever moment I have, I want to be the person who says, yet I will rejoice. And look, we know what it's like to have big, broad challenges to that. We have certainly faced times where it's hard to rejoice together, right? 
And yet, the harder times are all the little things that happen, or even the big things that happen that seem to only affect us while everyone else is doing okay. And I want to be somebody who in the middle of those moments when all the things that I, want, that I usually tend to rely on fail, who says, yet I will rejoice. See, even if everything goes wrong and the things I rely on fail, I will trust in God. That's the type of declaration that Habakkuk is making here that I want to be able to make. And so as we look at it, I have to ask this question. How do we get there? If this is the goal, if this is who I want to be, if this is how I want my life to look, if I want people to say, man, Kyler was somebody who, no matter what happened, he would rely on God. He would rejoice anyway. That's not naturally what happens, right? Naturally, I rely on myself. I know none of you do that. But naturally, I rely on myself. And naturally... When things don't go the way that I think they should, I I then don't blame the self I was relying on. I get frustrated at all the other things that I couldn't have controlled. And yet there's a different kind of response I can have. I can have a a response that rejoices in the midst of this. So how do we get there? I think for this, if we look at the whole book of Habakkuk, it's just three chapters. It'll help us to kind of understand where this comes from. So we're going to go back and, and see that this starts with Habakkuk bringing his concerns to God. This starts with Habakkuk bringing his concerns to God and recognizing that God is big enough for these. We're going to read Habakkuk chapter 1, 2 through 4 here together. This is what it says. It says, How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere, I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? I see destruction, wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. He's hurting. He's in a spot here where he looks around and and things don't look good. I can identify. I've had moments where I look around and I'm like, God, this doesn't look like I would set things up. This moment isn't what I would plan. This system isn't what I would plan. There's brokenness all around us. Brokenness is everywhere and, and it can be too much sometimes. And I love that he was willing to bring this to God. See, this is a, a practice I think we have to get better at. As a church as a whole, I'm not just St. Paul, but as a church as a whole, we need to get better at this practice of lament. Lament is, is a powerful tool. I mean, when we think about the Psalms, a third of the Psalms are Psalms of lament, where, where people are bringing their struggles, their doubts, their fears, their questions, their anger even to God. And they're dealing with that as they come to him. And so this is a psalm of lament, kind of like we see lots of other psalms of lament, actually in the book of Psalm. One that's been a lot to my life over and over again is Psalm 73. And it clearly gives this this process of lament that we see. Uh, See, this is about that worship leader I was mentioning, Asaph. uh, And Asaph is is struggling. He, at the beginning of the psalm, he, he looks and he says, look, surely God's good to Israel. Surely he can be trusted. And then he admits, but as for me, I had almost slipped. For him, the problem was that he was looking around, and he was looking at the world around him, and the people who weren't trying to live for God seemed to be doing really well. Everything was going their way. There weren't problems coming at them. And from his perspective, as he was trying to live for God, he he was not doing well. He, he wasn't enough. He was overwhelmed. Things weren't going the way they were supposed to. And so as he walks through this process, he's almost slipped. I love this, this picture. It's, it, it's like he's almost slipping, is, is kind of starting to fall down the hill, right? Like he's catching himself in the midst of this fall. Uh, I, I hiked Mount Monadnock yesterday. Uh, there are some beautiful mountains in this region to hike. I can warn you, though, at the top of them, you'll have moments where you almost slip, right? 
And as we go up there, there's a, I think sometimes when I think I almost slipped and I read something like that in this, I think, oh, I just slipped a little as I was walking around my house or around town. This is a more drastic picture than that, right? This is, I almost slipped and fell and it was catastrophic, right? He talks about the damage it would have done to, to Israel and the people he leads if he, had, if he had even thought that way. And yet, by the end of this passage in Psalm 73, he gets to a spot where he's able to say, but as for me, God's presence is my good. It is good to be near God. Like, actually being with him is the reward. It is the good thing that I need. And so he, in that passage, gets there by doing exactly what we see Habakkuk do. Habakkuk brings his concerns to God. In, in verse 16 and 17 here in Psalm 73, we see this cool a cool verse that can just apply to so many different things. I can say a verse is cool, right? We see this cool verse uh, that, that helps us kind of understand a whole lot of things in life and how we should walk through them. It says, when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply till I enter, entered the sanctuary of God. And then for him, it says, then I understood their final destiny. Because he, the, the understanding their final destiny was he got a perspective on his problem that wasn't rooted in who he was. It was rooted in something bigger. It was rooted in the bigger picture. It was rooted in who God was. The, the version of this I memorized says, said that all this was oppressive to me until I entered God's sanctuary. See, when, when Habakkuk enters into this lament, what we're seeing here in Habakkuk is the process of Habakkuk going into God's sanctuary. What happened while he was there. And it's a little different than we see in the other Old Testament prophets because we actually see discourse, interaction between Habakkuk and God, and God here. God actually answers him. So I want to read that answer for you here in Habakkuk 1, uh, just the next verses. We're going to be in 5 and 6 here. This is what it says. The Lord replied, that's so great. I love that he replies to our, our struggles and doubts and hurts. The Lord replied, look around at the nations, look and be amazed, for I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe, even if someone told you about it. Okay, so far this sounds good. Like, all right, God, you're doing something big. I'm on board. I'm ready for this. I am raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. They will march across the world and conquer all other lands. All right, here's where this is not the answer I would have expected. <laughs> right? Like, God, as God sets this up, he's saying, he's saying, look, I'm doing something amazing. People are going to talk about this. Get ready, Habakkuk. You know those Babylonians? <laughs> they were not the nicest people. We don't have to go into a history of the Babylonians, but this is, this is not like here come the people you hope to be rescued by. Right? I'm raising up the Babylonians. They're going to conquer the lands. Can I tell you, my response right then would be, you're going to do what? Right? Like the, the new Top Gun movie is coming out. I was a fan of the original as a kid. And, and I, I remember the scene where, there where Maverick, Tom Cruise's character, is flying the plane. And, and he says, I'm going to hit the brakes and they'll fly right by. And his, co and his co pilot says, you're going to do what? Like, you don't hit the brakes when somebody's flying at you. Like, that can lead to destruction. And I, I see that kind of moment here. Like, God, I don't think you understand what I was asking. And we see that kind of response uh, as we continue on into verse 12 of that same chapter. Habakkuk starts to, to reply to God. He says, oh, Lord, my God, my holy one, you who are eternal, surely you don't plan to wipe us out. All right. <laughs> Many of you have had these moments. You go to God with something. And you start to see God's answer. And if you're honest, you have to admit, that wasn't what I had in mind, God. Right? Like, God, I see you doing something, but that's not what I had in mind. I had a different picture of this. In fact, maybe you want to take notes, God, my picture was a little better. All right? This is going to end up, end up looking better for me. Let's talk about this again. We're going to have a different look at how this can be. And, and Habakkuk brings a second complaint to God here. And he says, God, look, surely, uh, surely you don't mean to use the Babylonians, right? Like, this is not how this is going to happen. There, I was complaining about our people and the struggles they're having. And so you're going to send people who are worse and are struggling more weighed up. That's not what I'm looking for. 
And, and, and we're your chosen people, God. You're not going to destroy us in these moments. And he kind of goes through this and continues to have this, that's not what I meant, God, moment. And I, I love that Habakkuk was willing not only to bring his complaint to God the first time, but as he got the answer, he was willing to go to God and say, like, God, I don't understand. Help me out here. And so God is willing to respond to him a second time. We see this in Habakkuk 2, verses 2 and 3. This is what God says back to him. He says, Then the Lord said to me, Write my answers plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to the others. Like, pay attention. Other people need to know about this, right? Uh, this vision is for a future time. It describes the end, and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently. For it will surely take place, it will not be delayed. And then in the rest of chapter 2, he goes on to describe this, this idea where, look, the Babylonians are going to be judged too. This is all part of a bigger process. God is, is using the brokenness in our world to be redeemed and restored and to bring about his kingdom. And he's ultimately at work for his good. Even in things that we're like, God, how could you use that? Like, you don't understand, that doesn't line up with my thinking, God. And it's definitely a broken piece of our world, yet God uses the broken things of our world, thank goodness, because I'm one of them. God uses the broken things of our world as part of his plan to redeem the world and bring us into his kingdom. And so as we walk through this, we, we start to see where Habakkuk was reminded of God's power and God's faithfulness. See, Habakkuk was looking at the problems, Habakkuk was looking at the people, Habakkuk was looking at the issues, and God says, no, 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 wait, turn around, look at me. See, just because what God does doesn't line up what I, with what I thought God would do or should do doesn't mean that God's not good. We see this over and over again in Philippians chapter 4. We have this verse about what to do when we have our, our struggles that we face, uh, when we have different requests that we want to bring to God. We're told to bring them before him with thanksgiving in verse 6. And then it's another spot where I would think that God would say, and I'll take care of them. I'll make them all go away. But that's not what he says. What, what Philippians says is that, that God will bring us a peace that is beyond understanding. I believe that that comes when we come to God, when we enter his sanctuary, and he reminds us, as he did to Habakkuk here, who he is and who we are. And that he has control. And so as we walk through this process, I think there's this powerful thing God does. He shifts our perspective. He reminds us who he is and helps us to see what really matters. I love in that that he doesn't answer all our questions. I think of uh, briefly the story of Elijah. Where there's this moment where Elijah, remember the still small voice story? God, Elijah's on this mountain. He's, he's just been through a, a, a hard process of standing for God in the midst of a world that was completely set against him. Uh, and has seen some victories in that, but now he's run and he's ended up on this mountain saying, God, what's going on? And eventually we land at this spot where Elijah goes out and, there's, uh, and he thinks that God's going to be in the wind and he's not in the wind and he thinks that he's going to be in the storm and he's not in the storm. And, and all of a sudden there's this still small voice and it's God. Well, before we get there, we see the questions that Elijah is asking of God. And there's this spot where, he says, where God says, what's wrong, Elijah? And Elijah talks about how you know, everyone's against him, that he's been standing for God and now he's the only one of God's prophets left. Well, here's the problem. That's just not true. It's not true. Eventually, God sends him to other people. There's a remnant that God has kept of his people and of his prophets. But even before that, if you look just at a couple chapters before, Elijah had been with a group of 100 prophets of God that had been saved from the very destruction he's talking about. He comes with a complete untruth. And if I were God in that moment, which is a dangerous game to play, I would have wanted to say, Elijah, come on. You're saying you're the only one. You're not. Remember those hundred people? There are other people here. Why are you coming to me with these, these things that aren't even true? But that's not what God does. God walks him through that and, and reminds him who he is and speaks to him in that still small voice and then sends him out to the place where he will encounter other people who are for God, who are following after God. And so I, I love that this process happens for 
for each of us as we come to God, that he doesn't necessarily answer our questions, but he gives us a reminder of who he is and who we're created to be. And then he puts us to the places where our questions will be answered without us even realizing them because they weren't the main point anyway. The main point was shifting our perspective so we could remember who God is. Uh, Habakkuk responds in in chapter 3. I'm going to read just verse 2 for you here. Uh, It says, I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing works. In this time of our deep need, help us again as you did in years gone by. And in your anger, remember your mercy. And he continues in the rest of chapter 3. Read it this afternoon. Read it sometime this week. He continues to lay out the goodness of God and the power of God and who he is and how important it is for, for the people of Israel to remember him and to follow after him. And so we've got this moment where, where Habakkuk recognizes who God is and how God is at work. And it's then that we come back to chapter 3, verses 17 and 19. And so he then mentions these things where he's struggling. He says, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes in the vines, even though the olive crops fail and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. That's where we hit this. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. When you look at this whole process, this yet I will rejoice takes on some more weight, doesn't it? Because in the midst of my doubt, in the midst of my worry, in the midst of all the things going wrong, God shift my perspective so that even I can be someone who says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me sure-footed as the deer, able to tread upon the heights. There are still heights to tread upon, but he makes me able to tread upon the heights. Now, there are a couple of things that I want to remind us of uh, before we head out today. I think, I think a lot of times we hear information, but we've got information coming at us all the time, right? And so we'll, we'll read a passage or hear a talk about a passage, and uh, maybe there's some things that stand out in that even, but it's just more information that comes at us. But I think it's important that we pause and, and kind of allow ourselves to, to rest in that a little bit and process things that are going on. And I've talked about how this is true in struggle. That's the example that we see here, that in hard times, we, we need to be reminded of who God is. And we need to become people who say, yet I will rejoice. But I also want to remind us that that's true in good times, too. In fact, sometimes for me, those are the harder times to be a person who says, yet I will rejoice, because things are fine, so I don't have to slow down and rejoice. We see in Philippians uh, 4, 11 through 13, this picture of what we often use as just, hey, when things are going wrong, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But if we look just before it, it's not just in things that are going wrong. It's in, in time of plenty and in time of want, right? When things are going well and when things are going poorly. We want to be people who are able in those moments to look and say, hmm, I will rejoice. And so our world needs people who will rejoice and struggle. It's powerful when things are going wrong and we say, yet I will rejoice. I'll remember who God is. But our world also needs people who when things start to go right again and distractions come again and plenty comes again and we're in comfort again, we're still people who are going to say, wait a second, God, fix my perspective here. Help me not focus on my comfort. Help me not focus on the things that are going well. Help me focus on you and what you're doing in this moment and be someone who will say, yet I will rejoice. And so whether you're in a good moment now or you're in a moment where you just don't even know which way is up, my encouragement to you today is to kind of think through some questions. Uh, The first question is, how can you enter God's sanctuary. How can you enter God's sanctuary? What does that look like? In in good times or in bad times, we need to go into God's presence to have our our world turned upside down in the best way. And so it's great to be here in church in a sanctuary worshiping. But that's not the only and God works in these moments. But please don't let this be the only time you enter his presence. 
I mean, for me, it's sometimes it's during hikes. Sometimes it's driving around with my wife. Sometimes it's as I'm I'm reading the Bible on my own or listening to worship music on my own. Sometimes I have to set aside time in a prayer room to pause and pray for an hour because the first 48 minutes are just distracted mind movements, and I get 12 minutes of prayer out of it. Right? Like there are different things that happen here. Sometimes it's just. I have a pause app on my phone that reminds me twice a day to pause and give everyone and everything to God, right? So there are lots of ways that we need to remind ourselves to enter God's sanctuary, but, but what is it that you need to do to enter into God's sanctuary? When you do, what do you need to bring to God? What are the challenges that you're facing? The things that you are pushing aside or ignoring or even avoiding that you don't want to talk to God about, either because you're not sure you can trust him in that moment or because it's a moment of comfort and you're not sure you want him to mess with anything. What are the things that you need to bring to God? And then what do you need to do? What do you need to remember? We all need a bigger, better picture of who God is and who he created us to be and how he wants us to interact with the world around us. So how do you need a bigger picture of God? He's bigger than you think he is. And a better picture of God because God is more good than you can imagine. He is better than you can imagine. And he's created us and placed us in the, in the time and the space that he has us and will use us in that space. So what do you need to remember about who God is and who he created you to be? And as you do that, you, we have to all wrestle with this question of, will we rejoice? Will we rejoice? I'm going to put the, the, verse, the end verses up here, just 18 and 19 again. And I just want to end by, saying, by sharing my hope with you. My hope is that I will be a person who says, yet I will rejoice. Uh, but it's bigger than that. My hope is that when other th- people think about you, they'll say, wow, that's a person who really trusts God no matter what. No matter what. I've seen them do it when they're struggling. I've seen them do it when things are going well. That's a person who really trusts God no matter what. And that when this community looks at this church, that they'll think, wow, they really have joy even when everything seems like a huge mess. This is a church that has joy and hope when things seem hopeless and and when the world around them doesn't seem to to require this joy, it seems to require anger and frustration and bitterness. But will this be a church that radiates joy and hope to their community? And then for New England, my hope is that, that New England will look at the church, the larger church, and see that we serve a God who is powerful. And that we serve a God who is faithful and who can be trusted and who brings hope and peace and joy in the midst of their lives. Whether they're at a spot where they're recognizing that, there's, that all the things they've relied on are failing them. Or they're in a spot where it seems like success is right around the corner. Will New England see that there's more? Because of what God is doing in us and through us making us a people who say, yet I will rejoice. And so, God, I pray that today this would not be just something we talk about. But, God, would you, would you make us the type of people who rejoice in who you are and who you've created us to be, not in the, the circumstances of the moment, And would you use us to demonstrate your love and your power and your redemption and your hope to the world around us? It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.
down to buy me up You say you do it all in love That I might know you in your suffering And though you slay me Yet I will praise you the point in our service where we continue our worship through the giving of tithes and offerings and the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Here at St. Paul's, uh, the communion table is open to anybody who has put their faith in Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a member here. Uh, you just have to be believing in Jesus. And if you're not sure what that means or if that includes you, I'd love to talk to you about that sometime. If you'd like to talk more, um, talk to me after service and we can set up a time to get together. Because of COVID, we are still doing individual communion cups, and we will invite you to come up to the table this way. And uh, when you get to the table, I will invite you to receive, and then you can take the elements uh, with a amen or a thanks be to God, or you can cross yourself, or you can just take them, whatever you're comfortable doing, go back to your seat, and then when you feel ready to, to receive them, uh, you can do that on your own. We also want to encourage you to place in the basket underneath the communion table uh, your connection cards. Remember uh, that we have a team that prays over those cards every week. So right on the back, any prayer requests you have or uh, any good stories you have to share about ways that God has worked in your life. Um, if there's anything that you're interested in, any ways of getting involved, please write that somewhere on the card as well. We do our best to follow up on those throughout the week. Also, uh, we want to remind you that uh, 
If you have any offerings to give, we encourage you to place those in the basket underneath the table. Um, giving is important here at St. Paul's. It's the way that we as a uh, non-denominational independent church keep doing what we're doing. And uh, we just uh, encourage you to give, trusting uh, that we will steward those resources uh, to spread the kingdom of God. So one of the things that Kyler talked about in that passage in Habakkuk is how God ends up using things that might look really awful from our vantage point um, and, and somehow brings good out of them. And when you think about it, when we come and observe communion, we are testifying to our faith in his ability to do that because what we're observing at communion is that really the worst thing that ever happened in history was in some way the best thing, right? Because when Jesus was crucified, it was the incarnation of God, completely just, having a terrible injustice inflicted upon him. And yet through the eyes of faith now, when we remember that event, we see it as glorious because through that, uh, God was reconciling us to himself. And so I encourage you to think about that as you come forward and receive that in having faith in Christ, receiving the, his body and blood shed on your behalf, you're also having trust in God's ability to bring good out of the difficult things in, in our lives and in the world.
my quiet street with us as we sing our last song for the day. It's called Joy. <laughs>
Thank you again so much for uh, bringing the word this morning. Really appreciate it. Um, again, just want to remind you, if you're interested in participating in a small group this summer, please email me to let me know, ryan at stpaulswire.org. Same goes for those who might be watching online. And also, if you're interested in baptism this summer as well, uh, there's a class that you need to take um, but uh, it's brief and it's definitely worth your while to understand what baptism is all about. So also email me if you're interested in that. Let's say our benediction. While our service here has now ended, our worship has not ended because our worship never ends. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve his people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen.